Good afternoon, good morning, everyone. As you are logging in and we're getting ready to start this uh, this webinar on uh, respiratory syncytial virus and influenza infections, uh, there are some demographic questions that we would like you to answer. So if you can go ahead and do that as you're logging in, it will be greatly appreciated. I want to welcome everyone to today's webinar entitled Respiratory Syncytial Virus and Influenza Infections, New Immunization Approaches for Children. And it's a pleasure for me to moderate this webinar. My name is Carlos Del Rio. I'm at Emory University in Atlanta, and I'm also a member of the Board of Directors of the ISUSA. And it's really a pleasure for me to have uh, as our presenter today, and a huge honor to have Dr. Uh, Bonnie Maldonado, uh, who is a, a professor of pediatrics at Stanford University and really has been one of the leaders in, in the field of respiratory viral infections in children and adults and a, a colleague and, and collaborator for many years. Can I have the next slide? Uh, the the ISUSA has a, a board that, that looks at developing content for webs, webinars, and you can see here the uh, conflict of interest of the members of the board. The next one. And these are the uh, conflicts of interest and, and financial relationships with uh, ineligible companies of myself and Dr. Maldonado, as well as planners. Uh, as many activities for ISUSA, this is provides uh, continuous medical education. And uh, this webinar is designated to provide 1.25 hours of ABIM continuing medical education, but you can also get uh, CME credits, you get mock points, and you can see the different things you can get and instructions on how to claim your credit are available in www.isusa.org. Yeah. Uh, this uh, programs and many others would not be as possible without the uh, the grant support of many uh, of our supporters and you can see their names here and I wanna thank them. Now let's, uh, let's uh, uh, a very important part of this activity is answering questions. Uh, to submit your questions, please do so in the Q and A button. Do not submit questions in the chat button because they will not be answered. The chat function is only for me as moderator and for uh, uh, Dr. Bondo and I others to speak. So if you submit questions, do it through the Q&A button. The next one. So I'm gonna turn it over now to, uh, to Dr. Maldonado and Bonnie, it's all yours. Great, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Del Rio. And um, thanks to all of you for being here today. I'm uh, going to uh, actually, talk about uh, quite a um, quite a dense topic today, set of topics. Um, I think for pediatricians, RSV is quite well known, but there's a lot going on. So I'm gonna try to jump in very quickly and I will have my slides available afterwards because there's just a lot of information, but I wanna hit the high points and I want you to be able to see the graphs and data for which the recommendations were based on. So uh, let me just uh, see if I can change the slide. So you saw my disclosures already. And um, on completion of this activity, I want you to be able to incorporate the recently updated immunization recommendations from the CDC for schedules uh, of your pediatric patients, especially around RSV. Describe the new antibody uh, monoclonal antibody option for uh, respiratory syncytial virus prevention in infants eight months and younger, and then also to employ current pediatric influenza vaccine recommendations. So our poll question number one is here. Do you care for patients 18 years of age and under in your practice? And you just let me know when I can go to the next one. Oh, great. So, so this will be, I did put in some data on adults as well. So we'll be able to hear about that. 
um, as well. And my second question is, do you care for pregnant people in your practice? Great. Okay. So a good proportion as well. Thank you. All right. And uh, so um, here's our pre-test questions. I have two of them. The first one is, um, which of the following interventions is most likely to be effective in preventing RSV infection in infants? Single choice, either RSV vaccination of pregnant persons before 32 weeks gestation, RSV vaccination of grandparents 60 years of age and older, or administration of nirsevimab to a newborn infant. Oops, that. Okay, great. So good. So this will be helpful for our post-test session later. Now, the second question, which of the following statements applies to human and avian influenza infections? Avian flu is easily spread among birds. Avian flu is easily spread to humans or vaccines against human flu strains also protect humans against avian strains. Right. Oh, good. We have a little bit of equipoise here. So this will, hopefully I'll be able to help you answer the questions later. All right. So let's get started. And thank you for participating in that poll. So for many of you may know that RSV is a major cause of lower respiratory illness, especially among infants and children. But more recently, we're understanding the huge impact on older adults and adults with chronic medical conditions. RSV vaccine and immunoprophylaxis has progressed with over 40 candidate vaccines and monoclonal antibodies currently in development. And target populations are, are very broad and include infants and young children, pregnant women, and older adults. So let's talk about the epidemiology in children. So RSV is, if not the most common, one of the most common infect respiratory infections of early childhood with... Um, over half a million uh, medically attended RSV lower respiratory tract infections in the US, um, 400,000 office visits, 150,000 emergency department visits, and between 30 and 80,000 um, hospitalizations. Most infants are infected in the first year of life and essentially all infants at the by the age of two are infected. Premature infants in particular, those under 30 weeks gestations, have hospitalization rates three times higher than term infants with higher rates of ICU admission, mechanical ventilation with the uh, average cost of hospitalization in an infant uh, at less than 29 weeks is four times higher than that for term infants. And the, the unfortunate situation as well is that over about 80% of children hospitalized with RSV who are under two uh, have had no underlying medical conditions and about two to 3% of all infants every year will be hospitalized for RSV. So it's quite a big uh, burden of disease in children. Um, and so again, you see the pyramid here, but fortunately the death numbers are small around what we see for influenza every year, but really we would like to see those gone. 50 to 80,000 hospitalizations, um, half a million emergency department visits, and about one and a half million outpatient visits. Now, the other thing that we know about RSV is that it's very seasonal. And except for uh, a couple of exceptions we'll, we'll talk about, if you look at this slide for, uh, representing infections from 2011 to 2020, you see that it's highly seasonal, it's a winter virus. There is some fluctuation, but it's generally a winter virus. So we can't always predict exactly when it will start, but generally we think somewhere between September and March is the season, which some variability. And you can see that variability here with the, with the southern region starting a little bit earlier, um, last this past year, as many of you know, if you're in the south, it started in August. So we're seeing a peak RSV now in the south, whereas in many other parts of the country, it's just starting to take off. So you can see overall that we have to be somewhat uh, concerned about the seasonality, not only the seasonality, but the bit of a variability in that seasonality. And you see here, 
from 2015 to 2019 in the dotted line, you see the average uh, seasonal um, uh, 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 peak of RSV. But you can see that in the southern part of the US, it tends to start a little earlier and taper off a little faster. Um, but that isn't always the case. And then if, uh, particularly, we know that um, following one year of limited RSV circulation, so in 2020, you can see here that we really uh, did not have a uh, major season. Uh, if you look back from 2016 to 2020, um, the seasons were actually quite predictable. And then in 2020 to 2021, we uh, really uh, had no season at all. But then the 2021 to 2022 season really took off. And that was a horrific season um, with our uh, our hospitalizations around the country being uh, in historically record numbers for RSV. And that combined with COVID and flu was a terrible, what people might have called tridemic. And uh, fortunately, we're hoping not to see that again. But that was really probably an epidemiologic phenomenon resu re that resulted from the shutdowns of 2020. So if we look at hospitalization rates, our highest in children under five months of under six months of age. And you can see here, when you look at two surveys from CDC that reflect two different uh, periods from 2000 to 2004, and then from 2016 to 2020, you see that most of the hospitalizations occur under a year of age, and especially in children under six months of age. And emergency department visits are similar where you see the highest rates occurring in children between uh, zero and 12 months of age with the highest rates uh, being uh, under six months and as well, uh, sim very similar for outpatient pediatric clinics, very similar where you see the biggest burden there in the under one year of age child. And then finally, if you really want to do a deeper dive, again, from the same cohorts uh, through from 2000 to 2020, you see that especially children under four months of age are at highest risk. So this is a real conundrum because how do you, va if, let's assume you had a perfect vaccine, how would you vaccinate a newborn child to protect them when you know that it's going to take a while to get doses in? And probably by the time you get doses in, you're already going to wind up uh, with kids who are already infected before they've been vaccinated. So you'll see some of the strategies that were taken in the US and we're hoping that these will really help limit the disease. So in conclusion for this section, pre-pandemic RSV seasonality is well-defined with limited geographic variability. It's the most common cause of hospitalization in US infants with the highest rates in the first months of life, especially in the first three to six months of life. Um, and then prematurity and other chronic diseases increase the risk of hospitalization, but just proportionally, most hospitalization are in healthy term infants. And the currently licensed prevention product, which I'll talk about in a bit, which is palivizumab, really targets only 5% of US infants. So we'll talk about RSV candidate prevention candidates in, uh, coming up. So before we do that, we need to talk a little bit about RSV virology and immunology to understand those, those uh, approaches. So um, uh, RSV is a filamentous orthopneumovirus. It's a 15,000 base pair genome. It's a single negative sense strand virus, but it codes for two important proteins there in red, which are the F and the G protein. There are two viruses, RSV A and B strains. They co-circulate and there's no cross protection for these viruses and you can get infected over and over again. So we will see these viruses over and over again. They don't even, despite the fact that they don't mutate rapidly, we see them over and over, which indicates that we probably have short-term immunity. Now here's those uh, F and G proteins that we showed uh, the, the genome for. The G protein there in the yellow and the F, which looks like a, um, at, looks almost like an antibody in, in the uh, orange, and these are important critical targets for neutralizing antibody um, and products in, uh, in, uh, in the target, products that are in development target either the F alone or can target F and G. And uh, these are really um, important areas to consider. Now you can see here that the prefusion protein is really important. Um, and we did not understand that there was a prefusion protein. We were, uh, for many decades, targets for uh, vaccination really were targeted against this post-fusion protein, which is a very elongated piece here that you see. 
And when you look at the neutralizing potency of epitopes on this F protein, you can see that the highest level of neutralizing potency occurs in the site zero and to a certain extent in the site um, uh, five section, but also um, in the uh, here at the top of the prefusion protein. Um, what we didn't know is we had never really seen the prefusion protein. It tends to be unstable on the surface of the protein, and it also is not at all shown after fusion of the virus with the human epithelial cell. So you see that those highly neutralizing epitopes are completely hidden in the post-fusion protein. And that's where all of our immunology had been directed uh, prior to the last 10 to 15 years or so. So really once we understood the potency of this pre-fusion protein and our ability to actually stabilize it to make uh, accurate targets, um, we really weren't making much progress in targeting uh, our making doing the best at targeting our ability to um uh to prevent uh, rsv disease and so if we go to the next slide here in summary f and g are targets of neutralizing antibodies with most potent antibodies directed against the f protein as you see trial vaccine products have uh, uh f alone or uh, a combination of uh of uh, uh of r and f i'm uh, uh, sorry f and g antigens and immunoprophylaxis are really targeted against F. And also there is some heterogeneity in the RSV F, um, F epitope. So what are general categories of prevention modalities? Well, they fall into two major categories, that is vaccine products or immunoprophylaxis. And the vaccine products are live attenuated or chimeric, protein-based nucleic acid recombinant vectors, and in the immunoprophylaxis area, they primarily are monoclonal antibodies, and we have extensive experience with one monoclonal antibody. Um, now, if you look here at the path slide and the references at the bottom there, you can see that there are many different products that have been either investigated, discontinued, and inactive, or others that are still um, actively being pursued in the not only in the vaccines section, but also in the immunoprophylaxis. And you can see that at this time, we have uh, two major, three major products. One is GlaxoSmithKline and Pfizer RSVF proteins. They're uh, bivalent. And we see the AstraZeneca and Sanofi Nercevimab, as well as the AstraZeneca Pelavizumab product. And those are actively available now. And as you see, more to come. Now let's talk a little bit of palivizumab because we've had many decades of uh, many years of experience with palivizumab. It's a human monoclonal, humanized monoclonal IgG directed against the F protein. But as I mentioned before, it's it's targeted against the F post fusion protein, so not really the most uh, uh, neutralizing efficacy that we'd like to see. It's also needs monthly administration due to the short half life of antibodies. So you need five doses, each costing about $1,000 over the course of an RSV season. But it does have about 50% efficacy in ho preventing hospitalizations in preterm infants and those with chronic lung disease and children with congenital heart disease. And you see there the AAP recommendations, which have been around for many years now, for over 20 years. And we review those on a regular basis. But this is our current recommendation for palivizumab, which is really the major one being that it's limited to children under 29 weeks gestation. So again, not reaching the majority of children who are going to be infected and potentially hospitalized. So nirsevimab, what's important about this is that it's a nearly identical structure and mechanism of action as palivizumab, but there are two major, major differences. One is that it has 50 times enhanced neutralizing activity in, compared to palivizumab because it targets those really important pre-fusion epitopes. Secondly, it has a modified FC region to promote extension of the half-life to seven up to 73 days compared to palivizumab. It's not eliminated by the kidney or liver, not expect to interact with any other drugs or vaccines, and we have lots of experience with monoclonals in children, so their safety profiles are quite robust. And because of that long extent half-life, we can actually test, and I'll show you the data, we've tested the ability of this to protect with one single dose rather than five doses of palivizumab. So let's talk about the nirsevimab trials. And what you can see here is um, the uh, trials really were conducted across all infants, of uh, all young infants. There, the phase three pivotal trial was in 3,000 infants. Uh, greater than or equal to 35 weeks gestational age. 
And then the phase 2B pivotal trial um, of about 1,500 infants was in those 29 to less than 35 weeks gestation. And then finally, there was another phase 2, 3 pivotal trial of 1,500 infants with who were preterm less than 35 weeks uh, gestational age and infants with congenital uh, chronic lung disease or congenital heart disease. And so I'll cut to the chase here. You can see the efficacy overall um, for all subjects was very high between 76 and 78% efficacy for a medically attended RSV, lower respiratory tract infection for that uh, uh, lower respiratory tract disease with hospitalization and for severe disease. So highly efficacious uh, compared, especially when you look to palivizumab. Um, and the safety profile, as I mentioned, because these are monoclonals for which we have lots of experience, are very uncommon, but consist of rash, injection site um, reaction, or pyrexia. Now let's talk about the clinical trial data to show you a little more detail. So if you look at the preterm infant study of about 1,500 infants in the first RSV season, with the outcomes, uh, primary outcomes and secondary outcomes being uh, medically attended RSV, lower rep respiratory tract disease and hospitalization. You can see that there was a 70% um, uh, re uh, relative risk reduction uh, compared to placebo with overall 78.4% uh, uh, relative risk reduction for hospitalization. So quite striking for these preterm infants. If you see the data now for um, late preterm infants. So these were babies who were between 35 and 35 weeks gestation. Again, this is a group of about 3000 infants, very similar with uh, one injection and following these infants through the second RSV season as well. You see that there was a 70, about a 75% relative risk reduction compared to placebo of medically attended RSV lower respiratory tract infection and a 60% reduction in hospitalization. Now, if you look at the children with heart or lung disease in the second season, this is uh, about um, 900 infants looking at the second season, because the idea was, does, the, does that one shot, uh, does that one dose really protect in the second season or not? And you can see here, the incidence of adverse events was similar across groups. Um, they had um, the... Um, uh, they uh, there were no RSV lower respiratory tract infections through day 151, but really the data was really not helpful in understanding whether there was protection in the second season. The numbers were a lot smaller and the confidence intervals were quite wide. So really we have very strong evidence for season one, but not enough evidence for season two. So in summary, their primary and secondary endpoints for these studies evaluated the efficacy through 150 days Efficacy did not decline over the time period of this evaluation. And there is some evidence uh, from one study in South Africa and from some neutralizing antibody data from the lab in vitro data that protection could extend before beyond 150 days if you just measure neutralizing antibody titers. However, um, really looking at second season data uh, it will be really important and is not really uh, robust enough to really recommend a second season at this time. Now, if you look at cost effectiveness, this is a really important area to think about. And you see here that um, the number needed to immunize with nirsevimab to prevent one health outcome um, is actually quite low for outpatient disease, emergency department visits, and inpatient visits. Now higher, of course, for ICU stays, um, in but also low for inpatient days and ICU days. So it's quite a good um, ratio of number needed to treat. The cost per healthcare averted is actually quite reasonable as well, except for hospital uh, ICU stays, but really again, quite a robust uh, set of data here for this particular product. And remember this is something, and we'll talk about when uh, we are, are considering uh, when, when the, the Nerseva map should be administered to achieve these outcomes. So the FDA approval for Nerseva map occurred in July of this year. Uh, neo for neonates and infants born during or entering their first RSV season, and for children up to 24 months of age who remain vulnerable to severe RSV disease through their second RSV season. Now, following FDA approval, the CDC's ACIP also voted to approve uh, one dose of nirsevimab for all infants aged less than eight months of age, uh, eight months born during or entering their first RSV season. 
and one dose of nirsevimab for infants and children aged eight to 19 months who are at increased risk for severe RSV disease and entering their second RSV season. Now, this is a complicated slide. I'm sorry to show this, but uh, what I'm trying to tell you here is that the idea is if you, this is how we do palvizumab is you track when the baby's born, when you should start giving um, the monoclonal antibody to provide protection during the hypothetical start of the RSV season, given that we really never know when the season is really going to start, but we think it'll start usually around October and end usually around March. So essentially any baby born between April and September should get their first dose um, through their in their first RSV season, usually at October 1st and, through, uh, and at the latest um, uh, by March 1st. And that is to protect them through the whole RSV season. Now, a baby who is born uh, starting in October 1st um, uh, should get their dose uh, immediately um, uh, immediately in, uh, in the first week of life, if at all possible, either in the hospital or in an office at that point time. And this is opt optimal timing is during the birth hospitalization if possible. So this is really the summary of how to give the, the, the um, nirsevimab. Now, uh, the eligibility for the second season is, again, children 8 to 19 months of age with increased risk for severe disease who are recommended to receive it in their second season. And this is children with chronic lung disease of prematurity who require medical support, as outlined here, children with severe immunocompromise, children with cystic fibrosis with very specific manifestations of severe lung disease, and American Indian or Alaska Native children. Now, this is important because there have never been race-based or ethnic-based recommendations, but it's recognized that these are children who have higher risk overall um, for RSV disease um, given infection, uh, serious disease given infection. Now, the timing uh, providers should really aim for nirsevimab administration in the first week of life in infants born shortly before or during RSV season, as I mentioned, October through March. So administration uh, during, uh, can be given during the birth hospitalization or in the outpatient setting. And infants with prolonged birth hospitalization because of prematurity or other causes should receive nirsevimab shortly before or promptly after discharge and may be given to age eligible infants and children who have not yet received a dose at any time during the season um, and can be adjusted depending on the seasonal pattern. So for example, if RSV is starting earlier, we may, it may be um, recommended through uh, American Academy of Pediatrics or other recommendations to be given earlier as we've done before. We did that certainly during the pandemic. So if the season is atypical, um, the, um, recommendations could be changed to uh, provide protection sooner uh, if that is necessary. Um, there are a number of additional recommendations, which I'll leave in the slides for you to all peruse later, but I am not going to go through these right now, except to say that a child who has received nirsevimab does not need to continue to receive palavizumab if they were already on palavizumab. And I'd also like to mention that um, at this point, we've had, let me go back for a second, that we've had such a tremendous response to uh, nirsevimab orders that there's actually quite significant back ordering. And at this point, uh, practices are really urged to administer um, their store, their, their, uh, their uh, supply to the highest risk children, because at this point, I think there's a pretty, pretty significant limitation on stock stocks, uh, supplies available around the country. So um, similar to other routine vaccinations for children, it should be the storage um, would be um, administered as an intramuscular injection in either a 50 or 100 milligram dose. And the dose is weight by age, 50 milligrams if less than five kilos, 100 milligrams if uh, greater than or equal to five kilos, and 200 milligrams uh, for high-risk kids for the second RSV season. Um, and this is covered by insurance as well as BFC. Um, and I'm sorry, there's a data there on um, uh, on our clinic at Packard, for example, we only have one VFC clinic. So that would be a limitation for us. And we've chosen to try to vaccinate kids at, at the birth visit, at the birth hospitalization, and then in the, our VFC clinic there at Packard Children's. And those are the prices that are expected um, and we anticipate that prior authorization will be continued to be a, a needed. Now, the big challenges, of course, are equity of access, 
cost VFC considerations. And for example, for California, the immunization information needs to be um, needs to be captured if you can in your um, immunization registries. Coding is available and adverse event reporting needs to continue. Now, the big challenge, of course, is the maternal RSV vaccine and how to manage that. And we'll talk about that next. But again, around implementation of all of these strategies, we need to think about equity, alignment, cost, capacity, and evidence base. Um, I will, again, uh, Nursevimab will replace palivizumab at our institution here from November 1st to March 31st. And outpatient administration is pre preferred whenever possible. Uh, although at this point we are still uh, implementing here at our hospital birth administration until we run out of doses, which hopefully we won't. So let's talk about maternal RSV because this complicates the picture, but it's also a tremendous opportunity for us to provide an additional preventive measure for children. So as you all know, uh, the FDA approved the first vaccine for pregnant individuals to prevent RSV in infants in August of this year, pretty much overlapping with the approval of nirsevimab. And then the CDC approved this as well in September of, of 2023. The dose level is 120 milligrams. It's a single dose given to a pregnant woman. And again, it affects the prefusion F protein, which we've already talked about. Dr. Maldonado, you're muted. Oh, I'm sorry. Huh. I don't. Uh... I was able to hear her fine. Okay. No, I'm sorry. I'm okay. Sorry about that. Am I still? Can you? I hope you can all hear me. I can hear you fine, Bonnie. Okay. Thank you. Um, so groundbreaking structural work again has really allowed us to use the prefusion protein, and that is those are the trials that were conducted. And this was a trial um, uh, that really started in 2018 and actually got somewhat hamstrung because of the pandemic. And part of the reason it was hamstrung is you needed a placebo group, number one, and you needed people to be able to come into clinic, which was difficult during the lockdown. But number three, uh, there was no RSV season in 2020. So there were no cases of RSV. So the studies had to be retooled in 2021 to really do pivotal trials. But you see there are a number of phase one and two First in human, phase two B pregnant women trials in uh, pregnant women and non-pregnant women. And then finally, pregnant women efficacy trials in 2020 to 2022. And I'll summarize the data for you here. Uh, you can see that uh, RSV elicits maternal neutralizing titers um, uh, with geometric mean ratios greater than 12 at delivery compared to placebo. And you can see how robust those antibody levels are at one month at, after va vaccination of the pregnant woman at delivery, and then six months postpartum. Um, so you can see that this FC, um, this F modification of the FC really does allow for a long lasting neutralizing antibody to continue to circulate, which is a real big, really big breakthrough. You can see that transplacental transfer ratios are, do not vary by geography. As we know, maternal antibody levels that tr are pass actively transported across the placenta can vary based on maternal uh, nutritional and geographic status and socioeconomic status. So you can see here that whether the child, the family, the mother and the baby lived in the Northern or Southern hemisphere, there was really still adequate neutralizing antibody that crossed the placenta and that the levels based on uh, gestational age also varied a bit, but were actually above, uh, you know, were actually actively transferred across the placenta. And this is really important to notice. If you see the palivizumab levels in the red dotted line that we expect from every year's palivizumab, palivizumab dosing, you can see that the RSV uh, titers among the vaccinated women really are sustained uh, much higher than uh, that level and through six months um, after vaccination. So this is a really important uh, finding that indicates at least in looking at in vitro data that there should be protection at least through six months after vaccination. So if you look at the final uh, results of the over 7,300 women that were enrolled in these trials around the world, um, and you see the countries listed here, um, that they, first of all, represented a wide demographic population of race and ethnicity, which is really helpful in understanding how this vaccine is going to work across all populations. And the endpoints were really safety, which is always the main endpoint, but also primary and secondary 
efficacy, primary efficacy within 180 days and secondary within 360. And you can see here that when you look at local reactions, um, the reactions were really primarily painted at the injection site that were different from the placebo group, but also both groups experience a small degree of erythema and induration as well. Now, when you look at systemic events, uh, you can see compared to, remember, these are pregnant women. So a lot of the placebo recipients also experienced similar reactions, except for the uh, myalgias, which were higher, uh, the muscle pain, which was higher in the re vaccine recipients compared to placebo recipients. And this is the really big signal that was concerning. It was not statistically different, but it was concerning and it looks very small there at the bottom. The premature babies were born at a higher a non-statistical rate of 5.7% in the uh, in um, the vaccine recipients compared to 4.7 in the premature in the placebo recipients. And even though this was not statistically significant, there was concern that this could be an early signal of a risk for preterm birth. And this is what led to the decision to only allow vaccination uh, of pregnant women between 32 and 36 weeks. And that's why, again. Uh, I to lead the uh, bury the lead here. That is why the question, the pretest question around vaccinating pregnant women before 32 weeks is not a good answer because um, because the, you're only allowed to give it between 32 and 36 weeks gestation. And so here you see maternal deaths and fetal demise and infant deaths were actually distributed equally or, or more uh, represented in the placebo group, and none of these were related to uh, the, the not felt to be related by the investigators to the, the, the vaccine. Um, the endpoints here, primary endpoints of medically attended RSV LRTIs and severe LRTIs are listed here. And you can see the striking data, very similar to what we saw for nirsevimab to the infant directly. So between 90 and 180 days, you see between 70 and 80% or 82% vaccine efficacy, really striking through six months. Um, now, the data for um, uh, 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 RSV positive uh, uh, medically attended LRTI that wasn't severe is not as striking, but it's still important. It's between 50 and 57 percent. Uh, but again, severe disease is quite striking there. Now, if you look at uh, within 360, this, if you look all the way out to a year, the data are not as striking, and you also see that the confidence intervals are quite wide. So there's probably not going to be a lot of, of protection through the second uh, through the second RSV season, and hospitalizations as well, not going to be seen uh, significantly through the second RSV season. So what are the benefits, relative benefits and risks of maternal vaccination and nirsevimab? And you can see here, both products are safe and effective in preventing RSV lower respiratory virus infection, uh, infection in infants. And you can see this kind of data at the CDC website if you wanna uh, take a look there. You just go to CDC RSV and you'll find all of this information. So the benefits for the maternal RSV vaccine of Again, provides protection immediately after birth because the mother is already vaccinated and providing those antibodies to her fetus. Uh, you, there's no need for a, a, a pediatric a infant vaccination. Uh, may be more resistant to virus mutation. Again, that's theoretical. We don't have data for that. And, uh, and the risks would be protection would be reduced if there are a few antibodies produced. So again, transfer of maternal antibody can be somewhat variable. Uh, but generally can be high um, actively transported. And again, there's the potential risk of preterm birth, which we think is mitigated by giving the vaccine between 32 and 36 weeks. Now, uh, the benefits of nirsevimab, our studies of antibody levels suggest that protection might wane more slowly. Again, we don't have data for that because there are no head-to-head -head trials and can provide antibodies directly if the infant receives less antibodies from the mother um, and no risk of adverse pregnancy outcomes. Now, the risks involved really are potential limited availability as we've seen. We are really uh, 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 at a low uh, major back order. So we're ur urging people to consider vaccination of pregnant women between 32 and 36 weeks if they don't have access to nirsevimab. Now here's the benefit of both products. Each has certain advantages as we talked about, but this a survey of about 500 people uh, demonstrated that about 28% only wanted maternal vaccination, 25% only wanted RSV antibody injection, 38% wanted both, 
8% wanted none and 1% wanted uh, uh, something else. So there's a lot of interest as we have seen in, in both of these products. Now the cost effectiveness summary for giving both is really not very good. So at least half a million dollars uh, and ranging up to $10 million if you uh, think that both of these are gonna be helpful. That is giving both the vaccine and nirsevimab. So the real challenge for us is really to understand how to um, deal with nirsevimab if you don't know maternal vaccination status, for example, or if transferring documentation, documentation of maternal vaccination is difficult. So this is a big, this is probably the biggest issue that we're facing right now, in addition to the nirsevimab uh, supply chain issue. So scenarios to consider administration of nirsevimab um, when mother has been vaccinated is a receipt of maternal vaccine has not been confirmed by a healthcare record. If the infant was born within 14 days of vaccination, the vaccine may not have taken and provided enough transfer of placental and transplacental antibody to protect the baby. If the baby was born premature or if the healthcare provider recommends maximizing protection because the infant is at very high risk. Um, and so that would be a case by case decision. But these are scenarios to consider for administering your submab. Now here's CDC's outline of how to consider that. If these, there are three criteria uh, to be considered for children under eight months, either the mother did not receive RSV vaccine during pregnancy, um, greater than or equal to 14 days prior to birth, or the maternal status is unknown. The day of number two is the day of nirsevimab administration uh, uh, was during October through March, or they never re received a dose of nirsevimab. In that case, if all th three criteria are met, then nirsevimab is recommended. Now, um, in children eight to 19 months of age, the child would be at increased risk for RSV disease, the date of administration would be October through March and has not received one dose of uh, nirsevimab during the current season and has not received or has not received two total doses. In that case, nirsevimab is also recommended. And so that's a summary there. I wanna just briefly just talk about the vaccine in adults. Um, so the general epidemiology is that it's a frequent cause on previously not really considered of severe respiratory illness in older adults, lower awareness among healthcare providers and the public, and primarily because RSV tested was not, uh, testing was not performed because there was really no vaccine or treatment available. But here's a comparison of older adults and children under five. So you can see that the impact on adults is much higher, 14,000 deaths a year and 177,000 hospitalizations a year. And if you compare it to influenza, the burden is about the same, probably maybe a little lower, but about the same as the impact of influenza in adults. So very similar numbers. And again, a reason why we think that RSV should be considered for adults, especially those over 60, now, I don't, there's a number of studies I don't have time to go through, but in general, if you look, underlying medical conditions among adults 18 years of age and older in this particular study demonstrate that 94% of hospitalized adults with RSV have underlying condition, 46% had one to two conditions, 48% had three conditions or more. You see the top conditions are cardiovascular disease, uh, chronic lung disease, and diabetes mellitus. Now, at, compare that to the uh, 80% or more of children who have no underlying conditions. So this is a very different group and you really need to consider that. So the greatest risk for adults and the groups that um, we would consider for recommending vaccine these the, for people over 60, 60 and older would be among, for example, lung transfer recipients, um, stem cell transplant recipients, other immunocompromising conditions, um, and uh, because of the incidence of symptomatic disease and severe outcomes. And so um, I, I wanted to spend the last few minutes just updating you on human and avian influenza and talking first about influenza activity last year. Just by way of context, sir, currently, if you want to look at the data, you can go to CDC and CDC and flu, and you'll find the data. Right now, we have only about 200 isolates that have been turned into the national surveillance for the US and most of those are uh, type A and they're H1N1 at this point, but there's very few numbers. Um, the, and most of the thresh, epidemic thre the epidemic threshold has not yet been met, which means that we're not currently in, an ep in true flu epidemic season, but we may be getting there pretty soon. And that means that we may be for, a, for the first time in a few years 
have a normal influenza season, but don't hold me to that. I'm hoping that that will be the case. Um, so this is from last year's data and you can see last year in the red dots there, we had a very atypical season. We had a huge surge very early on um, that really um, combined with RSV and COVID really overwhelmed our healthcare systems. But the other thing that we found is that the vast majority were H3N2, uh, influenza A H3N2. So it was overwhelming in H3N2 year, which is why one of the reasons why we think this might be a predominant H1N1 this year. But we again, we never can tell. Um, you can see here again, uh, the red there on the lower right is H3N2, um, which really dominated the season. And if you see here again in the, um, the um, uh, 2022, 2023 red triangles, you see we had a very early season that peaked out early and was quite robust compared to uh, previous years going back to 2017. And you can see here, the age groups are really important. Zero to four being the highest risk group for outpatient illness that comes in for care. Now you could argue that adults just don't come in and people bring their kids in, but even so that's a pretty striking percentage. The next group is five to 24 years of age. Um, and then after that, it's 25 to 49, et cetera. Influenza associated hospitalizations overall, even though they peaked very early, when you compare them, for example, to other years, we did not see the rates per 100,000 population uh, were, as, were any more severe, but certainly again, combined with RSV and COVID really just really stressed our healthcare systems. And here you see the number of pediatric deaths. Currently, we only have fortunately one pediatric death documented this year so far in the United States, but last year we had 111 deaths and the range generally can run, I mean, one death in 2020 was very unusual. Usually the numbers are between 30 and 200. So we had a pretty severe year last year, all things considered. Uh, so let's talk about vaccine effectiveness from the National New Vaccine Surveillance Network. And overall, I just wanna to cut to the chase here and show you that the vaccine effectiveness overall um, really depends on the age. So you can see from six to 17 years of age, it's about 49% with uh, prevention of inpatient and ED visits uh, 68 and 42%. And actually better coverage against H1N1, which was not the predominant strain, uh, but 45% against H1N1. And keep in mind that overall vaccine effectiveness for flu vaccines is generally anywhere between 10 and 60%. So this is well within the normal range of what we see around the uh, uh, every, every flu season. Um, and then you see here that overall preliminary uh, interim estimates from the CDC uh, are 68% against pediatric hospitalizations and 42% against pediatric ED visits. Um, if you look at data for uh, uh, adults and uh, uh, older adult, younger adults and older adults, you see the numbers are a little smaller. And in general, we see vaccine effectiveness rates are highest in under 18 year olds. But here you see between 35 and 51%, depending on the age of the person, particularly lowest, unfortunately, among those greater than or equal to 65 years. So the summary here is that you see that um, across three uh, influenza vaccine effectiveness platforms, we observed consistently consistent flu vaccine effectiveness during the last season. It provided substantial protection against patient emergency department and outpatient illness among all ages. And vaccination provided substantial proportion protection among important high-risk groups. So let's take a quick look at uh, current recommendations. Uh, they have really not changed. So vaccinations are rec recommended for everyone six months and older who don't have rec co contraindications. Uh, the timing is unchanged. Um, updates include the vaccination composition and there's talk that we will potentially be eliminating one of the B Yamagata strains, but that hasn't been decided yet so far. And uh, proposed changes to allow for vaccination for persons with egg allergy. So again, timing is not changed. Um, for children who require two doses, they should receive their first dose as soon as possible, including during July and August to allow the second dose uh, to be received ideally by the end of last month. And for those children who received, require only one dose, again, could be given 
um, uh, during July and August can be considered. Now, we know that there are some people who are giving doses later in the season for adults because they're worried about uh, a waning of immunity later in the season. That is not recommended for children. And it's actually um, because there's no data to suggest that that happens for children at this point. This is the flu vaccine composition for 2023-2024. Um, I think you can take a look at this at your leisure later. Um, and the safety update, 173 million doses distributed in the U.S. Uh, by VAERS and BSD have tracked. Um, there were no new safety concerns. Now, just to mention that in the past, there had been a signal for ischemic stroke when giving the flu vaccine along with the mRNA COVID vaccine in persons greater than or equal 65 years of age in VSD. However, post-signal analysis uh, and separate analyses did not confirm that there was that risk. So this was an early signal that was found not to hold true over additional monitoring. Now let's uh, talk in the last very few minutes here about highly pathogenic avian flu. It's what keeps up a lot of national and international leaders up at night because we do worry about these potential human pathogens. Now, there's a really nice website at the USDA to, con to track this disease, if this is something you're into or you have a farm. Um, confirmations of highly pathic avi avian flu in commercial and backyard flocks. You can see that um, these are the states where there have been HPAIs or highly pathogenic avian influenzas identified, and they are essentially every state. Um, wild birds detection over probably by now 60 million poultry, and luckily only one case in a human uh, documented um, in 2022. This is a wonderful slide from the American Ornithological Society uh, demonstrating the life cycle of flu and how it moves around. Essentially, the reservoir is wild birds, and we have learned so much about wild bird migration because of flu and understanding their um, uh, how to maintain those uh, important wild bird populations. But the bad news is that they they move all over the place and they bring uh, these viruses to our domestic birds. And those domestic birds that can then uh, sit uh, beside our other wildlife and our other livestock, our domesticated livestock. And in particular, pigs and chickens are very good reservoirs to actually attenuate these so that they can then become human influenza strains. So these are very good examples of classic spillover events. Fortunately, the pig attenuation renders the virus less pathogenic than the original uh, highly pathogenic avian flu. So we are still protected by that mechanism, but we worry that it's only a matter of time that one of these will get through the Swiss cheese of, um, of all of these potential protections in spillover events. Now, avian flu or bird flu refers to the disease caused by type A flu viruses in birds. They naturally spread among wild aquatic birds worldwide and can infect domestic poultry and other bird and animal species. Uh, they don't normally infect humans. In fact, they are pretty resistant to transmission to humans for all the reasons I mentioned below uh, previously and that they really need to go through an intermediate species, normally the pig, in order to be attenuated, but that also attenuates the virulence. However, we have seen around three to 400 or so uh, transmission spillover events into humans with bird flu viruses, which have occurred. Now, wild aquatic birds, uh, including all the, the strains listed there, are reservoirs for flu A viruses, and they have 18 HA subtypes and 11 uh, neuraminidase subtypes. So you can imagine all of the different permutations that can be de developed with recombination. Fortunately, um, only two of these H1N1 and H3N2 circulate in humans and they are not as virulent. In birds, there have been many, many subtypes identified, but not all of them are pathogenic. Um, and you can see that um, they don't regularly spread among, among species either, uh, so that equine uh, influenza can routinely cause illness in horses and canine influenza, which is highly infectious and highly deadly to dogs, can, um, uh, can circulate among dogs, but generally tend to be, tend to not to spill over into other species either. Now, um, what does HPAI mean? So this is highly pathogenic avian influenza. Most are not highly pathogenic. So only the H5 and H7 
uh, 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 strains are classified as HPAIs. Um, and most of the, most of the H5 and H7s at the same time are low pathogenic, even in birds. But they can spread rapidly through poultry flocks. And we have talked about vaccination of poultry flocks, but it's not cost effective, primarily because by the time you vaccinate the poultry flock, they've already had the opportunity to asymptomatically spread influenza through their population. So it really has not really been a good mechanism to prevent disease. Um, uh, uh, because by the time you identify it, it's already been uh, uh, pop, uh, perpetuated through the flock. And unfortunately, culling is the main way to prevent disease from spreading. And in those situations, up to a 90 to 100% mortality in chickens, for example, can occur within 48 hours. But ducks, for example, can be infected without any signs of illness. So the issue here is this is a feedback loop, right? So you can then spill those strains back into the wild birds and then you develop another pattern for resulting uh, further geographic spread to the next year. Um, again, fortunately, both LPAI and HPAI caused mild to severe illness in infected humans. Um, and uh, we are uh, fortunately still protected. We don't really understand why at this point, there's a lot of issue around dual use studies. So we don't have a lot of data at this point, but we are trying to do studies to understand those virulence factors. The US government fortunately has developed H5N1 and H7N9 bird flu vaccines in case they're needed. Those are the most, those, those are the predominance types that we think could affect humans in the future. The US federal government maintains a stockpile against these, and these could be used if similar viruses began spreading from person to person. And of course, because the platform is available, we could then modulate the H, the H and N antigens if we needed to, if a new serotype popped up and started to create problems in humans. As a general precaution then, given that we're not vaccinating here, um, whenever possible, people should avoid direct contact with wild birds and observe them only from a distance. Wild birds can be infected even if they don't look sick. And again, as I mentioned, that's why we don't vaccinate birds. Avoid unprotected contact with domestic birds that look sick or have died, and don't touch surfaces that may be contaminated with secretions from wild or domestic birds. Um, and so I'll end with this final slide. Um, and this is what keeps us all in business is this idea of global emerging infections. We need better surveillance. Um, we hope that in a new White House plan, the Biden administration will help us with pandemic preparedness and the uh, global infectious disease surveillance continues to be a part of the One Health and um, One Health and Planetary Health initiatives that all of our organizations support uh, on a regular basis. So, with that, um, I'm sorry I took you through this quite quickly, but there's a lot of information for this season. Although all of it essentially is really good news, uh, we're very happy to see these two prevention strategies available and. Um, Really hope that all of you can take advantage of those. So thank you for your attention. Well, thank you, Bonnie. And this was uh, just a chock full of information. This is a great webinar. And I just want to remind everybody that the slides will be made available so you can actually look at them uh, at your own pace and because and, and, there's really a lot of information here. And if you've never heard it before, it's just hard to keep up. Uh, there's some questions that have come up in the chat and some are fairly easy to answer uh, and some are very tough to answer. So the first one is very straightforward. What are the implications of mRNA technology with respect to vaccine safety? Yeah, um, I think, you know, it's an opportunity, just like all the other opportunities for mRNA. We're actually talking now, of course, about inverse vaccinations to, to prevent autoimmune disease. So I think that it has not been lost on the mRNA community that they could try to develop vaccines for, um, for flu. And certainly the advantage there, of course, is hopefully the cost, but also the speed at which they could build these vaccine platforms. So um, I will remind all of you that um, several years ago, we had uh, our surveillance had identified the normal circulating strains of viruses. And as you recall, influenza travels from south to north and from east to west. So generally what we see in the southern and eastern hemispheres are what we use for our vaccines uh, later on uh, in the in our season. And one year, there was a boatload of Australian tourists that showed up on the shores of New York City. 
and they had an <laughs> atypical strain of influenza that had not been picked up yet on surveillance because it was brand new. And that was a strain that wound up affecting the United States. And of course, the vaccine was not prepared for that. And we had terrible vaccine efficacy that year. So in those cases, supposedly we could, if we understand the mRNA companies, they could potentially uh, ramp up or stand up a six to eight week new vaccine um, in a in 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 the in the future. So I think it's it is an opportunity for us. So a couple of questions you talked about the supply chain, uh, but you know, near city map, some people are saying you just can't find it. And and what are the supply chain challenges? And could you talk a little bit about those? Yeah, it's not clear to me what the supply chain issues are, but frankly, what I think happened is everybody was excited about this. But we were initially skeptical, at least as the American Academy of Pediatrics represented, we were thinking people aren't going to use it because it's too hard this first year. We don't have VFC yet. We don't know what the insurance companies are going to do. What if I buy vials of this and I, I and I and I as a small practice can't afford, I don't get reimbursed. I'm going to wind up taking a big hit. What if families don't want it yet? So there was a lot of uncertainty this year. And what we found is that wasn't the case. People jumped on it. I was really surprised, even going from July to August to September, people were so excited. I think everyone just ordered, ordered all of the doses they wanted. And I don't think the company honestly was prepared. So I think it's really just a matter of not be prepared for the overwhelming response. I don't think there's any particular supply chain issues involved. And I'm hoping that next year we'll do better. Thank you. Are there any data that you mentioned some data, but correlating neutralizing antibody levels with clinical outcome. Yeah, you know, there's there really isn't any data. The only thing we can do is extrapolate from palivizumab, right? So um, if you look at palivizumab mm -hmm. levels, we can just track titers over time. And that's how we do most of our work, right, is immunobridgeny. But I do think that the data, what to me, is this is just a great argument for why we need to support basic science because if we had, we just didn't know what we didn't know. We didn't realize we were looking at the wrong version of this protein. Spending 40 years, no, since the 60s. So basically 60 years looking at the wrong version of a protein, not because we didn't want to, but because we didn't have the tools to be able to look at the nuance of how a protein will shift in confirmation once an infection occurs. So I think that um, the real issue here is our ability to really um, understand um, how we can uh, pivot when we see uh, when we see uh, a new product that's that's that can really address these issues. There's a question about you know why is, is RSV vaccine provides more resistance to viral mutations compared to nirvizumab? Yeah, you know that I think is a hypothetical. I think the idea is that if you put, provide passive antibody to the baby before birth, that perhaps um, you can prevent uh, replication before the, you know, at a very early stage. Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure I understand that argument very well because I mean the mechanism should be very similar, right? The baby has antibody one way or the other, so I'm not quite sure if circulation, if, if you if you reduce circulation a priori by vaccinating pregnant women, maybe you're just reducing the number of circulating viruses in the community. But that argument wasn't very clear to me either, but that's what the CDC put out as a potential downside. It's not a big downside, by the way, I don't think. And by the way, RSV doesn't mutate that much anyway. So right. it's just not a virus that mutates. So I can't imagine that it would impact, and it hasn't mutated that much with all these years of using palivizumab either, so. Yeah. Are there any studies that you know of, of nervizumab in, in elderly and, and what do we, outside the pediatric age, what is happening? Yeah, I, you know, we're not seeing a lot of that activity right now. What we are seeing, I'll tell you what we are seeing, and we're going to be involved with this trial. Um, we're actually looking, the companies are looking at RSV vaccination of the two-year-olds and older, because the question is, if you uh, abrogate the early disease in the young infants, and those kids are gonna get infected after two years of age, right? Is that gonna to lead to later onset complications? So for example, bronchiolitis or asthma, we don't know what happened, but we know that in 2022, when we had RSV for the first time in kids who had never seen it up until four or five years of age, the hospitalization rate, even in the older kids was pretty high. So um, the question is, 
are we going to need to start vaccinating older kids because we're preventing disease in, in them when they're very young? So that's one area that we're looking at. Um, I do think that nirsevimab for adults might be interesting to use, but I think a vaccine for the older adult might actually be much easier to do. Either way, they get a shot. So um, I, 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 I think that's an, a possibility that I haven't seen that play out yet, though. So there's a question about, you know, you mentioned this a little bit. Is there any risk to the, uh, let's say the, the mother, the birthing person receives the vaccine after 32 weeks and then giving the newborn uh, their Sivimab? No, there's absolutely, I, I, we, again, no head-to-head -head trials here, but it, there's no theoretical risk there. The real issue is really from a cost-effectiveness perspective. If you do both, you're not really gaining a lot of um, effectiveness or efficacy at a cost that can be, as I mentioned, half a million to $10 million per case averted because you would be doing it on a societal level. On an individual level, if it happens, it shouldn't be a problem, but it's generally not gonna be an issue unless um, the children meet those criteria. For example, let's just say um, the mother was vaccinated and the baby was born, say a week after vaccination, then that baby probably didn't get enough antibody. So those were the situations where I think it would make the biggest difference. But in general, I don't really, they're both great products. It's just that you don't want, you, the question is, you don't wanna give both of them uh, because you really don't get an increment, real incremental benefit there. Yeah, is there, are there any, any contraindications to the Pfizer or the GSK RSV vaccines? Uh, no, I don't, I haven't seen any major contraindications to the vaccines at this point. Um, other than the, so what are you telling you know, people as far as, you know, people frequently ask me, you know, now there's COVID there's, I'm 65, there's COVID, there's influenza, there's RSV. Do I get them together? Do I get them separately? What are the right. risks? Well, so that's the really important issue that I think, I don't think we can answer this season. So, um, I do. I did talk to a pediatric cardiologist about the data because it turns out that if you look at the data for the 60 year olds and older, there's a small signal for a AFib um, as well as Guillain-Barré. Now we're all familiar with Guillain-Barré being associated with every every infection or non-infectious process. Um, so that I'm not as concerned about because it, it was a very low level signal. The AFib is a bit concerning because it seems like it could be related to the age of the patient, much like we saw uh, cardio, uh, very, very rare cases of myocarditis among males 16 to 39 years of age who got COVID uh, mRNA vaccines. And that's because those are the age groups that already are predisposed to those diseases. And whether or not inflammation from the vaccine could be exacerbating that is not clear yet. Now, again, granted the signal for AFib was very low and we want to track that over time. But I think people who are generally healthy, as you saw the data I presented, if you have one or two or three underlying conditions and you're over 60, uh, then you might think that the, the benefit would be there. But uh, absent that, uh, people are foregoing the RSV vaccine at this point until they get a little better handle on the AFib situation. And we've asked the CDC to provide that data in real time as that comes into VSD and VAERS. I'm not super concerned about it, but it does. it is something that we just don't have a good answer for yet. Yeah, it's very hard. Uh, yeah. So how about vaccination of, uh, of people who are, for example, high-risk adults, let's say uh, somebody with severe asthma? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, as you know, um, once a vaccine is licensed, you can give it to whoever you think should get it. The question is, will you be reimbursed? But I do think that there are going to be special cases and it is allowed there. If you have a patient, an individual who does have very high risk, severe asthma, if they've got many underlying conditions, but maybe they don't meet other criteria, you might consider that because those are the people who are being hospitalized um, for RSV. And you saw the pyramid that I, I showed you, although to be fair, the, the vast majority of those are people 60 and older, there will be some, uh, younger individuals who are, uh, severely immunocompromised or have other underlying conditions who could be at risk. So just to note that you're, even if you're, um, you know, if you're going off label, as you say, um, that may be a consideration that you might want to bring up with colleagues before you decide to do that. 
No, for for sure. I think that's uh, that's really really important. Well, you know, Bonnie, there's obviously a lot of of information here, and a lot is happening. And I think you know the issue right now is how do we ensure that 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 these vaccines are used again frequently? I hear uh, you know Paul Tarnstein used to always tell me vaccines don't save lives, vaccination saves lives. Mm -hmm. We know that only seven percent of the U.S. population has received the the updated COVID vaccine. You know, typically 40% of the U.S. population receives a flu vaccine. I don't know what's going to happen with RSV. So so we got these tools. Now we need to get them implemented and we increase uptake. And, and I think that's the challenge that we all have, right? No kidding. Uh, I think, you know, again, I, I am a bit um, I am a, a bit encouraged by the uptake of Nercevimab. I have no idea right now what's going on with the maternal RSV vaccine. I'm hoping that that moves in a good direction. Um, I think we just have an opportunity here to really keep these populations out of the hospital. And I, but you already know what what our response is to flu, and we know how bad that can be every season. So how we continue to message this? I mean, I you can't watch television at all, especially during the football games, without watching an RSV commercial on TV now. So I think it's starting to penetrate the public. But I think we as providers need to really make a good case. And I can tell you that most adult providers, I'm a pediatrician, but most adult providers said, what's RSV? Why, why are we worried about it? And again, if you don't, you don't know what you don't know, we never looked because there was no reason to, we didn't have anything to do. So I think we really need to do a lot of education. And that's why this is such a great platform to do that. Well, thank you. I'm gonna thank you for, for this ex excellent webinar. And now there's a couple of questions for people to answer, a post-test question uh, here for people to answer. I hope we all get 100%. Next question. The next slide. Great. Well, thank you very much. Again, we really welcome you completing your evaluation, your evaluations of this of this uh, meeting, so you can claim your CME. Uh, we appreciate your feedback, and 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 please let us know about webinars, how you like them, and whether you can, other topics you want us to touch on. The next one. I want to mention that uh, next week there's going to be a webinar, uh, HIV 101, initial management of the of antiretroviral therapy and monitoring of patients with newly diagnosed HIV with some very well-known people. There's also, we're continuing talking about implementation of long-acting antiretrovirals for treatment and prevention. And it'll be a webinar uh, on Monday, November 13th to talk about this topic. And finally, we are still working on, on getting you substance use disorder education that is useful for your DEA certification. And the fourth of this webinars, fourth and fifth are coming up. And again, they should be terrific. And we will be having uh, the annual uh, ISUSA Washington DC uh, course, update on HIV medicine and emerging challenges. And there is the information on the course and please uh, please join us on that event if you happen to be around DC. Oh yeah, somebody wants to know how we did on the quiz. I'm curious too. <laughs> and thanks everybody for participating. You can see here that uh, here's the post-test question two. Perfect. I think I pretty much answered question one for you, but yeah, great. Okay, well, thank you very I, much. I'll just add that question one was a hundred percent correct. <laughs> great Yay. job, Dr. Yeah. Maldonado. Good, good. Thanks, everybody. And you'll have everybody. the slides. Please feel free to disseminate the slides for everybody. There's a lot there, and I'm sorry for making it so dense, but there's just so much going on. It's very exciting times for us. Have a good day, and we'll see you soon. Take care.